Well, welcome everyone. And if you're, uh, if you're joining us on a stream afterwards, uh, good day to you, whatever time it is. I want to begin by just, uh, just giving full disclosure, Anthony Beattie, I was a 20 year police veteran in one of the most violent cities in America, according to the FBI's national crime report. And after 2020, I partnered with the Watts Connection and Sherry Watts to co-found Peace, Police Engagement and Community Excellent, which is what brings us here today to further discussions that will help communities and police departments work together. So uh, I also wanna begin by saying thank you and giving recognition to Acacia Dietz. She is the Managing Director of Beyond Barriers and to thank Beyond Barriers for uh, lending us her services to help out today. Uh, I'm gonna introduce everybody in the panel uh, alphabetically so that you all can know as we have this conversation, what a, a, what a wide array of expertise we have joining us and why you should be listening to them. So I'll begin with Kiana Beckles. You, it, she is the CEO of Leverage Assessments. Leverage Assessments develops, validates, and administers fair selection tests. Also provides psychological assessments, credential management, diversity recommendations, adverse impact review, promotional tests, and job analysis. Kiana has a master's degree in industrial organizational psychology and getting her degree, she was featured in a CBS article. So this isn't the first time she's been on a national news stage. Uh, she's the founder of the Black Government Contracting Club and also CEO of Community Policing Strategies, a collective of black experts working collaboratively to solve the problems in our own communities. Uh, community Policing Strategies uses a multi-stakeholder approach to create inclusive solutions within communities. I've had the opportunity to speak with her on several occasions and know that she brings a lot to the table. Now, if you've seen the show, lie to me. The next panelist I'm introducing is a real-life personification of the main character from that show. Athena Grace is the founder of the Social Intelligence Project, and she's a human behavior analyst, an executive coach, and public relations strategist. Athena holds a graduate degree in industrial and organizational psychology, and she's also certified in the surveillance and counterintelligence techniques, reading micro expressions, hence my connection to the Lie to Me show, nonverbal and paraverbal communication, and sophisticated modes of human lie detection. Athena brings a decade, more than a decade, of experience in personality and behavior profiling. She's worked with Army Special Operations Command, directly with Special Forces personnel and leadership, and currently advises chiefs of police, as well as provides training on social emotional intelligence skills. Uh, next is Mr. Jeff Shope. Jeff is the founder of Beyond Barriers, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. If you're looking to make uh, donations here as the tax year winds up, consider Beyond Barriers. They're an organization committed to a new approach of countering and preventing extremism. Jeff was for 27 years, the leader of the largest neo-Nazi organization in the United States, the National Socialist Movement. In March, 2019, he, was the, he became the highest profile white supremacist to walk away and became a former white supremacist. So all of you on here, he is, he is not advocating any kind of supremacy anymore. Uh, he is uniquely qualified, however, uh, being in extremism for 27 years to understand extremism and their ideologies. He now works as a consultant internationally. He was just on with the Australian Parliament, uh, helping to educate communities and policymakers on the threat of white supremacy and how to effectively counter and prevent extremism. But last but certainly not least is Dr. Alfred Titus Jr. Uh, Dr. Titus is a retired NYPD homicide detective and hostage negotiator. He had 23 years on the job in New York City. And in addition to that, obviously by his title, obtained his doctorate. He has his doctoral degree in public policy and administration with a concentration of course in criminal justice. His dissertation, discussed community policing and homeland security. Hence, he's a great asset to the panel discussion here. He is a multiple author. He's authored The Personal Side of Policing, excuse me, Policing, 
an in-depth look at how a career in law enforcement can change and affect your life. He's also offered Forward Motion, the Keys to Progress and Success. And I think maybe my most favorite title is his most recent one, a children's book, The Police Are Part of Our Community. So you can see we've got a great set of panelists here today. I'm gonna to begin just by bringing a couple people in for a, a quick question. And Athena, I'll start with you. As we look at this whole issue affecting our society, do you think, first of all, citizens should have expectations of law enforcement? And, and what do you think that is, as far as law enforcement being professionals? Sorry. There should be an expectation of, right? Um, unmute, of professionalism that has to do with social intelligence. There should be an ability to be respectful, to be kind, to give people the benefit of the doubt, innocent until proven guilty, to have conversations with people and to be respectful in their approach. That should be possible. And it is possible with the right training. Police get a lot of point and shoot training, um, but do they get the social intelligence training to communicate with the public? And I think it is fair to expect to be treated that way, respectfully. Hard to dis dis yeah, then I was muted. Hard to disagree with that. Uh, Dr. Titus is somebody who worked in the largest law enforcement agency in the world. What are, what are your views on this? Well, um, Anthony, I agree with Athena. Um, in New York City, the motto for the law for NYPD is courtesy, professionalism, and respect. And the citizens of New York City should expect all three of those. Additionally, um, law enforcement agencies throughout the country are now requiring uh, some form of formal college education, and they are uh, involved in different types of, of training, community policing training and things like that. So um, the community should expect the very best from law enforcement. They should expect, as Athena mentioned, uh, individuals who, who work with the community are part of the community and not necessarily living in the community, but being a part of the community, meaning you know the business owners, you know the residents, you know the children that 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 walk by every day. And it's and, and to me, community policing is a huge part of making that happen. Additionally, the community should expect that when there are uh, confrontations that police continue to handle them professionally and follow the letter of the law and refrain from abuse and, and things like that. And, and training as well as um, proper recruitment, seem, in my opinion, is the key to that. We're, we're definitely going to dive into that training and recruitment part here, sir. Uh, first, I want to I wanna bring in our other two panelists. Uh, Kiana? What about you? What do you think? I, I'm going to flip that around a little bit. Looking at the other side, what do you think officers, should officers expect anything from citizens and society? And, and then what can they expect? That's an interesting question. And forgive me, because every once in a while, you will hear a loud drill <laughs> in the background. And it might give you um, flashbacks of being at the dentist's office, but um, you know that, that's a good question about what what officers can expect because there is I'm seeing um, some municipalities moving moving towards the trend of um, community training where they're actually training uh, members of the community as to how to interact, how to support police officers, right? Bystander training, that sort of thing, and so it's it's interesting to um, to put that kind of um, responsibility on, you know, so, so that some, some, some municipalities are saying that that responsibility is not just that of the um, police officers or of the agency, but it's also the responsibility of the community members and then also going about the work of actually giving them specialized training to show them how to interact and how they can assist 
um, if they are, if they do happen to be a bystander um, when, there, when there's an incident. So, so I think that that's a question though that different municipalities and agencies have to answer for themselves. It's interesting to see how each township is, is going about it a little bit differently. Can you, can you still hear me? Or am I just yes, <laughs> really, I, I heard the whole thing at least. I was thinking, oh, well, you're cool. Sound, sounds like you've got a jackhammer on the floor above you there at some point. <laughs> That's yeah. probably exactly what's happening, actually. <laughs> Uh, it's good to live in the big New York, right? In the Big Apple. Uh, Mr. Show, as we, uh, I'll pass that off to you as well. What about the community side of things? Do, do we, it, it, how do we look at the real partnership there? Well, I, I just want to back up what uh, Dr. Titus, Athena, and, and uh, Kiana said as well. And, and from the community standpoint, um, basically, there's a lot of uh, dehumanization going on where people from the community side dehumanize police officers because of some of the negative things they've seen in the media and so on and so forth. So anything that we can do to improve that relationship between the police and community, and that's, that's the community's responsibility too. We can't just say this is all on our, our police departments to have to uh, fix these problems. It works both ways, but the training I, I agree for on the police side, I think that's incredibly important and getting to know the people in the community. So more, the more engagement and dialogue, uh, relational dialogue we can have between community groups, between police, whether it's town hall meetings, uh, things of that nature, the more of that interaction, the, the better uh, community trust can be built up. And, and I do think that's incredibly important because this is, is some, I know some people say they don't like to hear this all sides stuff, but this is all sides, absolutely. All sides need to work on this and, and we can improve it. Yeah, I, I have to jump on and agree with you there. I mean, we're, we're talking about something that affects, and Kiana, I think, has got a great point. Communities can look at, at solutions that fit their community, but we're talking about a, a national societal problem here, and we all have to work together to, to come to some solutions on that. I, I, I actually saw it, but two articles recently that I, I'm going to throw out and then I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Titus briefly. Uh, article just this morning, Kiana, talking about how uh, NYPD and... and before, you, before, you, before you finish the question, can you, when you go back, I know that you go back and forth between moderator and panelists, do you have like a separate hat that you, that you can put on when you're, when you're doing your law enforcement perspective? And then have like a moderator hat because I'm, I'm just getting a little I'm getting a little confused. This is the moderator, right? Getting ready to pose a question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm moderating again. I'm I'm going to oh, throw okay. out some some recent information and and then we'll we'll let you guys bat it around. Uh, and and kudos to the NYPD who has taken their police academy and opened it up to where uh, citizens can enroll uh, four hours uh, four hours a week for six weeks and go through. Uh, obviously a very condensed version of what police officers go through, but what a great way to engage the community in seeing what police officers work. Now, the other side of that is a question I saw posed on social media. That, that's a great concept because where else do we have citizens asking for oversight of highly trained professionals? And, and so I'll, I'll throw this out there. What, what do you all see as the professionalism of policing, because when I look at, when I think about professionalism, I think of doctors and lawyers and teachers who have not only a, a credentialed education, but then ongoing education requirements, which frankly, I, I, I didn't experience here uh, as a police officer in Michigan. But then I look at the other side of that, doctors as professionals make on average across the US $206,000, and there are over 1 million, not, not doctors of studies, but medical doctors, over 1 million medical doctors. There's over 1.3 million lawyers across the US, making an average of $122,000 a year. Both of those statistics come from US News and World Report, by the way, 2019 statistics. Uh, Public school teachers, 3.2 million public school teachers across the country, 
making an average of $65,000. That's the only one that comes close to police departments. But then there's that whole, uh, you know, do they really get summers off question. Uh, and that's from the National Educators Association. Police officers, on the other hand, have fewer than 700,000 police officers. And we're talking about millions with all these other professions, 700,000 to keep the police, uh, keep the peace across the country, making national average 67,000, but 10% of the police officers across the country make less than $31,000 a year. So just some, just some quick statistics to throw that out out there because uh, Dr. Titus, as you talk about training and recruitment, <laughs> that's a black cat crossing your path. <laughs> uh, as you talk about uh, training and recruitment, Dr. Titus, there's, there's some obvious uh, difficulties with some agencies where you can't even you can't even pay a professional, let alone go through the hiring process. So how, how do you see that? What kind of work are you doing? I'll, I'll just leave it open and I'll just make sure we pass it the microphone. Whatever. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Anthony. First, I'd like to address the whole uh, Citizens Police Academy. Um, when I was in NYPD, maybe about five years before I retired, I became part of the Citizens Police Academy and I taught a uh, homicide investigators course, of course, an abbreviated version for the community, basically giving them insight on what detectives do and what detectives, um, how detectives handle investigations and things like that. And um, they went through different stages. They, they even went through like a uh, FATS machine, which is a simulated shooting um, uh, shoot, don't shoot type of scenarios, which is the greatest. Uh, you know, it's really excellent to watch them realize that it's not so easy to make that split second decision when you have a gun in your hand. And, um, you know, the training and the, the driver's training and everything like that. But it was amazing because it, it, it opened the eyes and the minds of the community and it allowed them to see that not only was it great training as far as being fun and exciting, but it was essential because it gave them an entirely new insight and outlook on what law enforcement does and the stresses that law enforcement um, officers deal with on a regular basis. So that part was, was amazing. So I think that, um, and, and it's been around for a while, and I know there are other agencies, particularly larger agencies, that have citizen police academies, but it should be done uh, across the country. But uh, to the question, um, yeah, there, there obviously needs to be a shift. And of course, coming from a law enforcement officer, I may be a little biased with the salaries and things like that, but, you know, it's it's almost like so many conversations that you see on social media and that you have in, 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 in particular circles, how sports and entertainment players are paid so much and, and the essential nurses and firemen and, and, and law enforcement, they're not paid properly. So that is an issue. I don't know if that will ever be addressed properly because you know the title civil service kind of has this stigma to it that kind of leaves it right there, regardless of how you try to, you know, improve upon it. But the training is key, as well as selecting the right individuals. Um, in New York City, there is a huge call for law enforcement to be, uh, law enforcement officers to be taken from the city instead of some of the out, out, outlying suburbs. And a big issue with that is the salaries, because living in the city is much more expensive than it is to live out in Long Island and, and, and Westchester and other areas. So everything ties together, you know, until society, and, and, and I think we've moved even further away from that now, from what I'm about to say, but until society realizes how important law enforcement and public safety is to their just well-being, and their, their ability to sleep at night and their ability to wake up and still have all their possessions around them when they wake up. Those simple things, you know, until society realized just how important that is. I don't know if that would ever change. 
Yeah, it, it certainly is a challenge that is leading our time and, and part of the reason for our discussions here. So uh, uh, Athena, I know, uh, I know you and Ken are gonna wanna talk a little bit about that hiring process, right? So, uh, so tell us about the work that you're doing and how that can help police agencies. For sure. Um, and I'm interested to hear, Kiana, what you have to say. I've been working with a lot of police chiefs recently to, to hire during their screening process, during their promotional process, looking for those psychometric assessments, looking for natural social intelligence skills, looking for officers that by being recruited and promoted from within can help change the culture of policing, which, which does need some adjustment because it needs to expand. Um, it needs to have a broader view, I think, of, of what is normal and what skills are most useful. Um, while there is a lot of physical training, hands-on training, that point and shoot training, like Dr. Titus mentioned, when I train Green Berets, they are very big on diplomacy skills. The idea is you go into a dangerous area, a territory where people don't trust you and you're not sure whom you can trust and you make friends, you build trust and respect in that community. And that takes social skills. Um, some people naturally have developed those to a greater extent, empathy. Um, do we, are we looking for officers that have empathy, that have primal empathy, that have attunement, meaning they really listen, right? How good is their social cognition when you go from one cultural area to another, when you're interacting with someone that has a certain background? Are you understanding how they're perceiving you? And are you aware of the emotions that are going through them? So for the hiring process, especially in Northern California, um, there's been a couple of police stations that are really into it up there. And we've been hiring, I mean, I can say the panels, the outside assessment have had a very different view of who they would have chosen before and after hearing the input on someone's social intelligence. And quickly to Kiana's previous point about the community engagement and everyone truly saying that is one of the things we've been doing as well is training on officers. I didn't know this. If you get pulled over, right? Turn on your inside lights, your, your car lights, have it. I had no idea that that's something officers would like you to do. So kind of coming to that understanding of that would make a difference. We had no idea that officers were taught that we should do that. And then that also gives communities and police a chance to say, I like that policy or I, I don't like that policy and come to that conclusion together. So that kind of adds to the social intelligence. But yes, I think that is a key thing we haven't been looking for and it can change the culture of policing. Very much so. Bigger, longer term solution. But before, Kiana, I'm going to kick it off to you. Uh, uh, Athena, I'm assuming, just so that people can't say, well, everybody should be doing that. I'm assuming you're not doing that for free. That's not pro bono work. Oh, no, <laughs> that isn't for free. That's part of the assessment process. Um, I have done a few, just so people can get the idea of what they could get from it. But no, that that isn't, unless there was a need in a different way. Yeah. Well, and and I only, I, I, I don't criticize because Peace does our training. And again, we charge for it. However, I don't want people thinking, well, all police departments should just do this because uh, again, you're bringing in an expert to provide expert analysis. There is a, a cost involved with that. So uh, I, I agree and support communities using your services. They, they just got to realize. Budgeted in, yeah. I, I what goes along with it, right? Now, Kiana, from from one industrial organizational psychologist to yes. another. Yes. Yes. Glad to see the IOs in the building represented. Right. Um, but you work for free, right, Kiana? No, never. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I mean, we're all on the same page. Honestly, if if my bills were always paid, I would I would work for free. Um, but my landlord is going to expect his rent no later than the first of the month, just like the folks at the grocery store demand their payment as soon as I walk out with the food. And so it can be difficult to uh, to continually provide you services for free if you don't have a sponsor who's there uh, to pay your expenses. And the same thing with you know my team or my team members. 
Um, and we got bills. Not only do we have, you know, rent to pay, but we got all this education. Some of us got loan payments to make and, and all the like. Um, let me also say, Athena, it is lovely to meet your cat. And let me say that we love our black cats just as much as we love our white cats. Agreed. And the gray ones, I swear he's dark gray, but yes. We love all the cats on the rainbow. I have an orange one that might join us at some point. Um, and then I don't know what the question was. I'm glad that we have Dr. Titus here um, to speak on behalf of NYPD because I certainly am a resident of NYC. Um, but, you know, the NYPD is, a, is their own uh, respective agency and their own sort of little city. Uh, I certainly did apply for the Citizen Academy maybe sometime pre-pandemic, maybe around 2017 or so. Um, but they were full. They were like, ma'am, you're just going to have to wait. I think that one of the things that we've seen is the expansion of programs that have already existed. And so to your point, Anthony, was, we're all starting to understand, right, allocation of resources is really important. You can have a program that stand, that's stood up and that's existing. But if you don't have the resources to fund it, to pay the trainers to come in there, to open up seats, then you know, people are not really gonna know about it. People are not really gonna be able to utilize it. So it sounds like um, that program not only maybe is being able, is getting some more funding and they're able to expand the amount of trainers, but they're also doing some marketing. You gotta have a marketing budget in order to let people know that the program exists. I think that was one of the challenges as well with the Citizens Academy, nobody had ever heard of it. Um, and then to your point about officer pay, officer pay is a huge um, conversation, not only when you speak about averages and when you look at how much we pay people like doctors and scientists, which a lot of time too is also correlated with these education levels and how expensive education is in our society. Um, but, uh, but also uh, when you, if you look at it at the micro level, um, a lot of our municipalities, our large municipalities are having that very similar challenge. They want to pay the officers really cheap, you know, and not, not to, you know, not against any municipalities for, you know, looking at how do you maintain such a large workforce at a reasonable cost, but a lot of them are offering lower pay, which makes them less able to compete with uh, the suburbs or the areas that are just outside of the city. So many of them have very similar challenges and they get people in and you basically as a rookie officer might be making the decision between, okay, do I stay here? Do I stay here for a couple of years and take this low pay while I got to get shot at? Or, you know, can I move out to this neighboring jurisdiction, get shot at a little bit less and they actually gonna pay me a little bit more. I mean, when you, when you look at the difference in some cases where it's like a 20 or 30 minute commute, you know, it's a, it's a no brainer. And if you were in that same position, you would probably make that same, uh, that same choice about just, just moving out. And, and that's what creates the sort of, I don't wanna say dearth of talent, but it, it, becomes, it becomes very difficult for our large municipalities to offer, to really be competitive in terms of the talent that they are attracting. Um, and that is, you know, do I want to say, and, and then you, 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 I mean, you got into, you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of calls for officers to live in the municipality that they serve or in the district or what have you. But, you know, if you increase in my rent <laughs> exponentially, it's like, are you offer? Okay. You could, if I'm, you know, serving X district and that puts me in the middle of upper Manhattan, are you also going to pay my rent <laughs> for that, you know, for, for living in that district? So um, to your point, again, it, a lot of it does also go back to that allocation of dollars, allocation of resources, and that if we aren't willing to agree on how we want our dollars to be spent, we're not gonna get the results that we're seeking. Which goes back to the work I know you do and community policing strategies advertises it, right? It's that whole community aspect, bringing all the stakeholders in to have a conversation about how things are gonna work in the future, right? So I, I wanna highlight that. Again, huge, huge proponent of the work these ladies do and advocating communities, contacting them for their services. Uh, Mr. Show, you are, you are last in this discussion, but not least, and, and Tell us about your thoughts with this issue with 
professionalism and policing in the work that you're doing? Well, in the, in the work that we're doing, and I don't want to bounce off of what Athena said too about empathy. I think that is a, that is a key component in the work that we do in relational dialogue. And, and that's one of the, the skill sets that, uh, that we try to bring to the conversation here is to get the communities and the police to work together, have conflict resolution, have dialogue, have these, have these conversations, these difficult conversations, and basically rehumanize uh, one another. As a society, this is a problem that, that we're facing uh, across the whole of society, where a lot of people you know, are concerned about themselves, basically just themselves and what's, what's around them, and they're not seeing the humanity in the so-called other or the person that's sitting across from them. And that's, that's really absolutely key in the work that we're all doing here because um, once you have that breakdown where you don't see the person sitting across from you as a human being or as an equal or you don't want to hear what they have to say because you think you know better or you're that set in your ways I mean, that's the kind of that's the kind of thing we encounter all the time especially working in the extremism uh, field is is having just these dead set ideas where you can't break out of that line of thinking so it's incredible it's incredibly important to have that relational dialogue between both sides get everybody together um, and and have a respectful kind and open-minded conversation because when there's when you lose that respect like when someone comes into a conversation and is yelling name calling um, or just not willing to listen you're not getting through. So having those kind of conversations is, is incredibly important. And as far as the policy and the, and the pay and all that, I agree with everything everybody was saying on that. You know, we struggle with that as well as a nonprofit. So um, that's all incredibly important as well. So I think this is a dynamic conversation and it's, it's incredibly important. And all the panelists uh, have, have had, uh, there's not a whole lot I can say to beyond what they've said because it's, it's that good. So, Dr. Titus, as, as somebody who's studied administration and as somebody who's spent a career in law enforcement, and I, I know it's not widely accepted, but I think one of the, certainly the, one of the most recognized agencies in the world, if not one of the most professional, what, what do you think, what can other agencies look at doing to increase professionalism in their in their police officers okay well um just to uh jump in on on, on what i'm actually doing I, I didn't mention that in in my last segment um i have a uh, consulting firm and what i do is i go into underserved communities and i do a workshop called learning positive interactions with law enforcement and I do a workshop and a seminar that shows the community police interactions. However, I show it from the mindset of the law enforcement officer, because that is the missing element. And not to say that the law enforcement officer is correct and the citizen is right or vice versa, but, we, but the community often does not know, as Athena said, how law enforcement officers are trained. I've actually put together a series of videos that shows a law enforcement officer walking up to a fully tinted vehicle and attempting to make contact with that vehicle. But not only do I just show the picture, I also explain that this officer may have seen a video in roll call this morning that showed officers getting killed by stopping vehicles. This officer is now thinking about his children and his wife, and is is am I going to see or husband? Am I going to see my children again? This could be it. All of that is running through that officer's mind just because of this dark tinted car that he has no idea what's behind that tinted window. So I do a workshop that explains all of that to to the community, and they actually love it. They. They don't understand why more law enforcement officers are not, I mean, agencies are doing that. So that's in, that's something else that I offer on the community side. But um, as far as professionalism, um, law, enforcement, law enforcement agencies must continue to train. Um, but what I think is also important, and all of us can probably attest to that, is that it is very important that they are able to look outside of the box. And when I say outside of the box, I mean 
be willing to tap into um, individuals outside of law enforcement, because sometimes you need a, a different perspective. Um, with a lot of laws and policies going on in New York City, I feel that they need the law enforcement perspective. But as far as law, enfor law enforcement itself, I feel sometimes they need the community's perspective. Of course, it would be professionals that come in and give them another, another outlook, because they may only be seeing it from the law enforcement perspective. And that's often one sided. So, um, and additionally, they need to continue to look for educated uh, candidates. Um, the colleges, the you know community colleges, as well as four year colleges. Um, they need to give more incentives. They need to obviously we discuss work or the 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 salary, but there's so much more to be done. But um, it's not a lost cause yet because things things are changing and things are are improving to some degree. So um, we'll we'll see what the future holds. It's not written in stone yet, and and I think it's conversations like these, uh, leading conversations across the country, will make help make that change. Ladies, what about you? Uh, we we've, we've heard a little bit about the work that you do. What do we do to increase professionalism in police officers, knowing that communities have to back that up with hiring and paying for it? I've gone first twice, Kiana. You go, and, and I'll follow on what you have to say. Um, well, I think that I think that increasing professionalism when you when it comes down to it, I think breaks down and means actually translates to a lot of different things in lots of communities. And I think that that's probably step one is just defining what what different communities mean by professionalism and understanding what they really want. And then I believe that it's about um, pulling the all of those objectives and goals through throughout the whole organization. I think that what I see the most is that we are happy to apply um, patches and fixes with trainings here and there, um, but don't necessarily go back and do the work of um, making sure that all of the you know, uh, performance evaluations and directives and general orders and all of the different little tiny policies and pieces that glue our departments together are aligned with that very mission and very uh, objective and very goals, you know, that come from that that drill down and operation operational definition of professionalism. So, um, so I think that that's one of the first stages is folks really coming together. Again, talking about that multi stakeholder approach, um, coming together with stakeholders in the community and defining exactly what they want, and then following through and making sure that um, agencies are following through completely. Uh, you know, as I say, like from the from the goals, mission, vision, values, like down to the roll calls, and updating everything in between to make sure that there's full alignment and the officers fully understand what we want from them and they're incentivized um, to do the same. Because I think I think a lot of uh, and it's not just I mean this is kind of government in general. It's not just our uh, police agencies. You know, but they'll go back and they do it. They'll do a training. Um, but then your your goals and your incentives are still from like the 1800s. So you're incentivizing people to continue to do some some habit that was put in place before, and so they're not their training that they received was not reinforced. What what I hear you saying, Athena, you're muted. What Sorry. I hear you saying, Yana, is if you want big community changes, you've got to put in some big community effort. Oh, absolutely. And to your point, Anthony, big community dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, because I'll add, because I'll add another point. Another thing that our, and it's again, it's not just our police agencies, it's it's our government agencies in general. Um, generally, when they want input from the community, they expect that input to come in a in a volunteer format. And just the same way that you don't expect um, your, you know, your your workers to come in for free. 
you shouldn't be relying on volunteers who are citizens to come in and work for free either. In a lot of cases, I will work and the success of our work that relies heavily on input from subject matter experts. And if you really want those folks to be able to weigh in with equality, you really should pay them the same way that we pay consultants, the same way that, we, same way that you pay your workers to come in and do their job. If you really want citizens to be a part of the process, include them in the budget as well. I couldn't agree with that more. Thank you for throwing that out there, Kiana, because that's absolutely the truth. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes time away from work you're doing that you are paid for. It should absolutely be part of the budget, whoever, however we're going to work that in, whether it's the police departments directly or whether it's the government funding that in and of itself. Um, when it comes to professionalism, I think sometimes what we're missing is that root problem, like Kiana was saying, what's the root of what that professionalism is? And while people come in yelling and screaming sometimes, um, like Jeff, as you mentioned, there's another, there's a deeper part of that, which is simply, we decide if we respect what we think about someone. Do we respect this person? Do we like this person within 10 seconds of meeting them? You know, to nine to 30 seconds, we've made up our mind. And so the training I do is to go in and say, this is what people are picking up from you. Within a few seconds, they've already decided if they respect you. And so you've got this really small window to make the impression that's positive so that citizens will work with you. And yelling is one thing, but simply having you know, a better than you attitude, having contempt written on your face, even if you're not speaking, that passive aggression, that rubs off on people. Once someone decides they don't like you, they don't respect you, you've got an uphill battle going from then on out, right? If they get the impression they do, they do have a connection with you from the beginning, you're actually working from a, you know, I liked this guy, I liked her. That, that, okay, I'm gonna listen now, right? You, you're actually in the advance. So the root problem, a lot of the time, is simply not understanding that it's not just what you say. What you say is 7%, you know, 93% of what you're saying is not in your words. And that really is where we decide if we respect someone and if we see them as a professional and are they being trained on that, both community and officers, but officers are the ones that come in and need to gain the respect. And we can't force other people to change their minds and see us how we want them to see. We have to give them the presentation that says, okay, I do, right? They're gonna make up their minds. They're gonna make that snap judgment. We want to present ourselves in a way that will be positive. And the incentivizing, I cannot agree with you more, Kiana. Some of these trainings I've gone in, and if you're the, if you're the officer that resolves an issue with no arrest, do you get positive praise for that? Or are you, right, like, is it how many arrests you've made, how many, or are you actually becoming officer of the month because you went on 10 calls and only had to make nine, I mean, one arrest, maybe nine were resolved and it was fine. Are we incentivizing what we're saying we want officers to change and do? And I think without that, you're not getting the praise, but you're also not getting respect for doing what's harder. It's harder to resolve something without having to, you know, drag someone in. And so I think that's really important, changing what we incentivize, changing what we pay people for. And one last thing, if officers and, and new officers coming in realized policing is so much more than arrests point and shoot using but if they realize it's helping people maybe you don't want to be a social worker maybe you actually want to be a police officer if you start to see policing as a different position right that still has the training and skills to be able to use weapons you know when you need to but that most of your job is really connecting and helping people I really think it would change who wants to be a police officer and that comes with pay, right? Because if it's gonna be a different kind of job, the kind of person that might even be a psychiatrist that some people want a little more action oriented job but to help people. So changing that picture of what policing is, it doesn't mean we have to lose the fact that they're skilled in using their arms. It's just, it's more than that. If that. 
No, I'm just trying to unmute. And couldn't click the button. No, that was there. <laughs> there was a, a lot there between you Sorry. two ladies. Right. Uh, Jeff, I was trying to decide whether he was going to be a, a whether he was going to be a panelist or weigh in. <laughs> well, there was there was a little bit of that too. I'm I'm sure. Uh, uh, I, I don't have quite the education Dr. Titus does, so I, he probably wasn't biting his tongue as much as I was with my law enforcement hat there. But uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff, I want to give you a chance to speak. Plus, I, I don't want to follow up all of that. That was a lot. Right. That was good. Um, I think what Athena said there too about the um, the dialogue between uh, both you know both sides. Uh, I think it's it's incredibly important and in how people perceive one another. So as she said about people coming in and having these perceptions making up their mind in the first 10 seconds of meeting someone this is where commonalities come into play when when you're meeting someone new and you're you're having conversations and uh like my colleague daryl davis who's uh, some of you know um that's what daryl does he walks into a scenario meets with people and finds those commonalities instantly because then you you're building uh, that human connection and that's where a lot of a lot of uh uh, people I think are missing the mark on different things, especially with uh, community and policing, is that a lot of communities in certain communities, they have this fear or this uh, misconception of the police. So when you have these engagement opportunities to to get together and have those conversations, when you see that the person sitting across from you is really no different than you are, and they have families that they're taking care of, and they have concerns, fears, worries, um, that sort of thing that breaks down so many things in in society and it then I slap my microphone here sorry for that <laughs> um, it, it breaks down those those misconceptions and when we do that everything improves it's just that it's that simple if we can bring people together to have those commonalities and get those understandings um, there's so much more we can do and, and I think uh, what Dr. Titus said at the beginning as well about how society views police departments. There's a lot of negative uh, opinions in different communities, especially, and they don't realize what, you know, they, they see what's in front of them. Most people don't have this ability to look into the future or to see beyond uh, the barriers that are in their minds. I have to do that. Um, if you're able to show them what it is that police departments are struggling with, what they have to, have to deal with. Like, uh, I think it was Dr. Titus, but it might've been Kiana where they talked about the tinted windows in the car and how the public doesn't, doesn't understand that or doesn't think about that. That's someone's life hanging in the balance there. And when people can understand that, that's how that works. All of a sudden it's, it's one of those aha moments, you know, where you're like, I'd never thought of it that way. Cause most people are not thinking of that. They're thinking what I, what they saw on the television was this terrible police officer took someone's life for no reason whatsoever. And that's what they hear from, from the media, or that's the narrative. And all of a sudden you have these defund the police movements and things like that. What people don't realize if you defund the police and it's total anarchy, the criminals and all the people that are um, looking for opportunities to do something wrong, are going to take advantage of that anarchy is not going to be a, a pretty sight and, and they have no idea they don't think beyond that they don't see that so uh, breaking down those common uh, breaking down those misconceptions excuse me and finding the commonalities um, has a lot to do with healing and, and improving those relationships yeah I, I, i'm glad you circle back to that jeff dr t that's one of the uh I think one of the times that the hair always stands up on the back of your neck when you're walking up to that car and you have no idea what's going on inside it or who's in it, uh, and and you got to do it. You know that's that's not a profession. You have the opportunity to walk away from from those encounters, so you have to do that. Uh, final thoughts from from any. I'll, I'll let you uh, select yourselves moving forward here. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first, uh, if, if, if no one minds. Um, um, I just wanted to circle back to what Athena and uh, Kiana were talking about with regards to incent incentives within law enforcement. Um, Athena, you touched on something that 
almost made my hair stand up as Anthony mentioned. When you said that um, officers should should be rewarded for coming in for handling 10 jobs and just having one arrest, do you know what kind of change that would be for law enforcement? That would be an amazing thing if law enforcement could take upon could take up that kind of mentality. That does not exist in law enforcement. I can honestly tell you. Well, I don't. I'm, I can't say across the whole United States, but that is not common in law enforcement. It is about arrest. Is it? It is about summonses. It is about bringing bringing in income, no matter what anyone wants to say that it's not about. That's what it's about. And um, that would be a complete transformation of the whole law enforcement industry. And maybe, I mean, that would have to be something that we would have to look at more in depth, but maybe that's what's needed. Um, maybe that is the key to changing some of the issues or all of the issues or many of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, it's, it's just something that I've never heard before. And, and I've been doing consulting and, and these podcasts and, and, and all kinds of things for a very long time, but <clears throat> I've never heard that. And, and it, it, it's kind of like turning on a light switch. It, it makes so much sense that both of you brought that out. It just It's just sensible. I just know that knowing law enforcement and knowing law enforcement administration, that would be a huge undertaking and you would get tremendous resistance. However, huge. It, 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 it sounds like something that should really be considered or maybe tried on a small scale or whatever, but it's, it's, it's great. Great idea, both of you. Yeah, Dr. Titus, you think about the, the ramifications of trying to implement that at NYPD, which is driven, driven. on the rest that you make. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? And that's, I've had conversations with Kiana. My agency gave you days off by the number of tickets that you wrote, right? right. Punitive right. actions, not community <laughs> engagement. Right. Huge challenges right. to, to change that mentality through an entire yeah. organization, but, yeah. but worthwhile, I think. I agree. Yes. Very worthwhile. And since we're talking about it, I'm going to piggyback on it. Um, we, we, we have had those conversations about incentivizing officers towards those punitive actions. And I always say, as long as I, we continue to measure productivity by punitive actions, we won't see any change. I think that what we need to do is really understand, first of all, how we want to measure de-escalation. If we could properly measure de-escalation and then build that as an incentive into every part of selection, every part of promotion, then we would make uh, much more headway in, in the direction where the communities really want to see the change. I, I agree. Dr. Titus, I'm, I'm sure you'll back this up. In police administration, though, there's still the push. Guy, I want you to think about this. Next to citizen tax dollars, the police department is the revenue source for most municipalities. Yes. Yes, Dr. True. Titus? Yes, that yeah. is true. Absolutely. Yeah. So much so that our agency changed policy and several times I can think of arresting somebody on a suspended license. They mandated an arrest so that our detention could charge $150 wow. before that person could be released. So now we're talking about people trying to get to work, right? So the, the government, the whole community, right? That's why I love your strategy, Kiana. The whole community has to come together to look at this issue and make that change. Like you're not gonna be able to get this revenue out of the police court system if you're you're driving a change for that. Uh, Athena, I know you've got the comment you wanna Oh, have. I just, I, this is, uh, Dr. Titus, thank you. But I actually wasn't sure what you were gonna say. I wasn't sure if you were <laughs> I can see you. I really, I was a little, I was like, wait a minute. Um, I, uh, yeah, I have gotten so much pushback on, on saying at the end of these trainings, if you don't change the incentivizing, which kind of thank you for mentioning it, then then no one will be incentivized to do it. And we have to actually support what we're asking them to do. And I do get pushback. You are absolutely right. 
the first I am met almost immediately with, I don't know if we can do that, you know, um, it would make such a difference in communities. I think that telling community members as well at these joint sessions that our goal is not to make arrests, right? That if we can do this together, that doesn't need to happen. And when both, you can't, you can't make true change without all sides being part of it, right? And so understanding that I definitely, everyone would talk about it farther, but the, um, I did, I can't even remember what I was going to say. I was so, I'm so taken with, with that. But I, I think that when we actually pay for the right people to come in and train and change this, it's going to make a difference. Right now, most of us are the ones that are doing this. We're, tr we're desperately trying to make a change. Even if we are being paid, we're volunteering a lot of our time at the same time to try to make, try to make changes. Um, so if I can remember what I was going to say, I'll come back, but I know we're almost out of time. So. Well, and, and I appreciate uh, each of you being here as volunteers in, in trying to further that conversation. I, I want to, I, I, I always want to make sure that we're looking at all aspects of it. Dr. Titus, uh, Athena mentioned that part of it, it being on the police officers to, to find other solutions. And that's where I, I know one of our uh, guests has a comment about defunding the police being a bad slogan because they're we, we're really talking about is funding mental health, housing, uh, other solutions, so police aren't mental health workers. But uh, in your time walking a beat, I'm sure you had the same kind of situations where I had, where there's it, your your job is to keep the peace in a situation. The resolution is to remove one of the people, yes. and that means an arrest, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, very common. That is that is the way it's done. That's that's the common practice. And you know, as as Athena and, and and Kiana said, that can change. We can change that and change the whole scenario. That can be done. Mm -hmm. it needs to be and done. It does. Sorry, interrupt you. I was going back up Kiana's point about de-escalation. That's what it was. Is that social intelligence itself is de-escalation. The word de-escalation almost implies someone is being dramatic and wrong and someone else is already calm and correct, right? And what social intelligence does is it reframes de-escalation to respect, human respect, right? And when you show someone else that respect, it, it's automatically de-escalating in a lot of ways. And I think our, our challenge there is to fund the police department social services, our, our mental health, right? Kiana, thanks for introducing us to your cat. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, any any comments there wrapping up? No, I think we got that covered. I think there was a couple of questions, I think, from the from the audience. I don't know if you saw those. I saw a couple of hands up. So maybe, maybe we want to get uh, some questions in from the audience if there's still time. I don't know. Uh, question is how we feel about being asked to solve wicked problems such as mental health issues and not crime. Uh, I'm guessing that's uh, intended for uh, police. Dr. Titus, uh, I'll let you as the, uh, as the police panelist, how do you think officers feel about being asked to solve mental health problems and not deal with crime? Well, it's funny you should mention that because the older, uh, more seasoned law enforcement officers, they struggle with that. They feel like we are here to uh, address the law and not, you know, we're not social workers. These are things that you hear commonly. The new officers that are coming in, the officers that I teach at John Jay College, I, I stress to them that this is a different job. The policing that you've seen on television, the policing that maybe your father or grandfather did is totally different. Um, this is a job where connecting with the community is key. And at some and, and I also tell them that it's a great time to get into law enforcement because a lot of them are not sure. A lot of them are very unsure because of everything that's going on. I said, you are coming in 
at a point where key changes are being made and you can be part of that. And with the right mentality, you can continue that and you can be the change. You can be more of the change than you even expected to be when you wanted to come onto law enforcement. So mental health is a part of policing. It, it's no longer a separate issue. And I, I think uh, most police careers, you find that the repeated contacts are usually with folks who have some disability. It's part of dealing with the job. Dr. Titus, you talk about dealing with the community. What size, I know, I know we're hitting our time there, but what size area, how many people is a, a patrol officer in New York dealing with? Wow, um, that would depend on the borough, but it could be uh, it, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people within one uh, patrol sector or one patrol borough. And, and if there are housing developments uh, within that, it's even more. Um, so it, it, it takes a effort to become this new kind of police officer. It does, because um, it's not what is commonly known as policing. So it does take an effort, but it's not difficult to do. It just has to be encouraged. And once it's encouraged and trained properly, we can have it, we can have it. Yeah, again, I, I, I wanna thank everybody for being on board. The solutions are out there. I think it's discussions like this, bringing together experts from across fields to come together and talk about the way forward that uh, that will provide those answers. So uh, thank all of you for your time. Thank those of you that are here live and especially if you're picking up this as a broadcast, as a recording and, and streaming it later, uh, thanks for your attention. You all stay safe and stay graceful.